Um, this is uh, one of his books, Shift, which is fabulous. You may know Dan from uh, Gruen Transfer uh, on television. Anybody watch that show? Love it, love it, love it. Love Dan's insights. In my mind, he's the guy who's in touch with real people. He's the guy that always gets it off the advertising talk and into what people really want. He's been responsible for some of the major marketing and advertising turnarounds uh, in our country, and uh, he'll have a moment to tell you about them. But we've been thinking a little bit. Dan and his business partner, Kieran, run effectively a creativity school. They help people have ideas on purpose, which is fantastic. But the work I've noticed, and I've used Dan in my business, um, he slums it every now and then, and I've asked him to help us figure some major problems out. And the thinking's got very little to do with marketing and advertising, and actually to do with a problem-solving mindset. And oh, these four speeches, the four books, they rock and roll. Um, Dan is one half of the strategic creative team behind the most successful product launch in Australia and turnaround. You'll hear about that with Coke and Mother. He lectures um, at Australia's premier ideas school. I love Dan, and I know you will too. Round of applause for Dan Gregory. There you go, sir. Okay. Good morning. A couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in a cafe and I heard a woman at the next table turn to her companion and whisper, He's the fat one off the growing tracks. <laughs> now, I don't know where she learned to whisper. I, I can only imagine it was inside a helicopter. But in my defence, I would like to point out that the camera does that anywhere between 10 and 120, 130 pounds. <laughs> Now, for those of you who haven't seen The Gruen Transfer, it's a television show about advertising. Now, advertising agencies used to make things like TV commercials and posters and press advertisements. But what we do more and more today is we innovate solutions. We invent new products. We solve problems. That's what I actually do. I, I solve problems. I'm like Harvey Keitel's character in Pulp Fiction, Mr. Wolf. <laughs> if you've got a... Mr. Wolf, if you've got a problem, maybe a corpse minus a head in the car in the garage, and it needs taken care of, and you know time is an issue because uh, your wife Bonnie's going to be home at 9.30, I'm your guy. So clearly I like, I like a challenge. So when Matt said to me, Dan, I'd like you to speak at Showcase, you're going to have 20 minutes. I said, great, 20 minutes? I'll give four keynotes. And Matt said to me, dude, you can't give four keynotes in 20 minutes. And I said, dude, in 20 minutes, I can convince 20 million Australians to get up off their sofas. <laughs> to come here and give me a remote. Tw 20 million Australians to get up off their sofas, to drive to the supermarket where they can do battle with other shoppers, also they can pay more per litre than they do for petrol for a product that is pretty much delivered to their homes for free. <laughs> I can totally do four keynotes in 20 minutes. <laughs> So today I'm going to take you through impossible thinking. Why the limits of our thinking are the limits of our lives. Shift, the trends and changes happening in our culture, our society and our values. Leapers and linkers, why we need to embrace both sides of our creativity and gravity. How to lead with alignment, engagement and attraction. And because I'm apparently doing the impossible, I'm going to start off with impossible thinking. So why do we need impossible thinking? Well, because problems cannot be solved without a belief beyond what is currently possible. We need more what if and why not and who says and a whole lot less you can't and just because. And that's not the way we do things around here, mister. The most innovative companies on the planet make impossible thinking part of their DNA. Facebook is now by population the third largest nation on earth in one generation. That is an impossible thought. Just imagine what Mark Zuckerberg will be capable of by the time he hits puberty. <laughs> Dyson makes a fan that doesn't even have a fan in it. That is an impossible thought. And this apartment in Hong Kong has 24 rooms that are all the same room. All the walls move to create different room configurations. The bathroom is in the living room, which is also the bedroom. All because Gary Chang had an impossible thought. They didn't use really hard thinking or quite difficult thinking. They used impossible thinking because the status quo has a stickiness to it and conventions cannot be challenged softly. So we need to stretch for the impossible because otherwise possible thinking will just keep coming back at us. 
And possible thinking always seems so reasonable, so realistic, so familiar. It's nice to us. I mean, possible thinking goes home at five and watches MasterChef while it eats chicken out of a bucket in its tracksuit pants. <laughs> Whereas impossible thinking re requires courage and commitment and pants without an elasticised waistline. Rosa Parks didn't turn to the white guy who told her to give up a seat on the bus and say, look, I'll just budge up a bit and we can share it. She had what was an impossible thought at the time. Winston Churchill didn't say, we shall fight them on the beaches. But look, if they make it past the sand, there's very little we can do at that point. <laughs> he said, we shall never surrender. Never, 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 never. Every sales call you make after a dozen rejections, every success you have after a hundred failures, every underdog who has its day is an impossible thought. And today we need impossible thinking more than ever because we're facing ever greater challenges and the world is shifting rapidly. The amount of change we're experiencing is truly extraordinary. Just 16 years ago, my business partners and I were the only people we knew with email addresses. This one might be worth writing down. But classic early adopters, right? The only people we could send email to was each other. We spent the whole day going, can I borrow your pencil? Send. Did you get it? And yet, 15 minutes ago, and yet 15 minutes ago, I approved a piece of work that was emailed to my iPhone as a PDF. 16 years and the world has changed in ways none of us could have predicted. Our success going forward will be based on our ability to understand and adapt to these shifts and I want to take you through a couple of them today. The first shift is from needs to wants. We no longer live in an age of need. Now obviously there are people in the world who do live in need, great need in fact, and the GFC hasn't made that list any shorter. But it's not for a lack of resources. I and mean, we've got enough food on this planet to feed everyone. And in Australia, we've got more than most. Jesus, before he lost his job, K Rudd bought half the population a plasma TV. <laughs> I mean, if the job at the UN doesn't pan out, he can probably get himself a job at the good guys. <laughs> there are 190,000 new product launches into the marketplace every year. That's roughly one every three minutes. And when you've got more and more choice, the net result is they're just not that into you. <laughs> From the point of view of consumers, we've all become Jennifer Aniston. And it doesn't matter how beautiful or wonderful or interesting we are, they know Angelina is out there. <laughs> so we're wanting more and we're expecting more, and that leads me to the next shift, the shift from means to meaning. When your basic needs are met, People base their decisions on higher values. They're now evaluating whether they interact with you or not based on your, your social footprint or your ethical footprint. Generation Y employees still rank meaning as more important than money in deciding whether they take a job or not, even in a post-GFC economy. Social change is now something that we expect to be engaged in. In fact, political change, if, if we want political change, politics is the last place we look. Peter Garrett should have stayed in the band and out of people's ceilings. <laughs> the power base has shifted and we've all got a part in it. Which leads me to the next shift, the shift from me to us. Technology means we are more connected than at any point in history. Consumers have become communers. Social media has more power than you can possibly believe. Today, social networking is the number one internet activity ahead of porn. I'll let that sink in. Social networking is the number one internet activity ahead of porn and according to socialnomics author Eric Quallman, 96% of Generation Y is connected to a social network. And it's not just Gen Y. The fastest growing group on Facebook is 55 to 65 year old women. That's right, Nana is poking people online. <laughs> now what these changes mean is we can no longer manage people and perceptions the way that we used to. We need to motivate differently, we need to remunerate differently, we need to communicate differently and we also need to educate differently because these shifts are having a profound effect on the work that we do, shifting us from process to creativity. Cre and creativity is a skill that we've neglected, a skill that we need to relearn and fortunately I have a keynote about that. <laughs> We're entering an ideas rush. As Nigel pointed out this morning, Creativity is now the critical leadership skill of the age. And yet we've left creativity unnurtured, underdeveloped, fending for itself. 
living rough in student accommodation in some finished jeans and eating gluten-free vegan food. Because that's the stereotype, isn't it, of a creative person, the starving artist? I mean, some of us aren't, obviously. <laughs> but the truth is, we are all creative and we all need to be. But at some point in our lives, typically in childhood, we either decide that we are creative or that we're not. Or more likely, someone decides for us and we believe them. I found a website that illustrates this point called IamBetterThanYourKids.com. And, and this guy posts real children's artwork and then critiques it mercilessly. <laughs> like this picture of a fire engine by Jason, age six. I reckon it's all right. This is the review it got. I've never seen a fire truck that needed to be shaved. <laughs> I would rather burn to death than be saved by this hairy piece of crap. <laughs> How harsh is that? But when you're a kid, that is what criticism sounds like. And that criticism shapes us. I believe there's a real divide between so-called left brain and right brain thinkers, and I blame Edward de Bono. In his classic, de Bono stated that lateral thinking was creative thinking, and I think he made a critical error, because I think he denied the creativity of a style of thinking dominant in at least 50% of the population. I think we need to stop arguing about lateral versus linear thinking and start thinking in terms of leapers and linkers. Now, leapers are those people who have the ability to just jump into a new possibility. <laughs> Leapers have what I refer to as thought Tourette's. They go, rocket, fish, pottery, and we end up with ceramic scales on the space shuttle. If you have, want a volume of ideas, you need leapers on your team. But if you want ideas that get you from where you are to where you could be, you're going to need linkers on your team. Linkers have the ability to create connections between previously disconnected concepts. They think in terms of analogies and points of reference. One of the best pieces of linking creativity I've ever seen is this poster I saw 20 years ago. The headline reads, one in four women will be raped in her lifetime. Will it be your mother, your sister, your daughter, or your wife? After I read that, that poster as a 19-year-old student, my sister never had to worry about a ride home no matter what time of night it was. My girlfriend used to find me waiting outside her college classes to work at, walk her home at night, and I still walk my business partner, Kieran, to her car every night after work. Not because I'm a nice guy, but because they created a link between me and the issue. They made women's safety my issue. So I think we need to start constructing teams of complementary creative skill sets. Because when they work together, magic happens. When we launched Nando's into Australia, they had a problem. They wanted to be famous, but they didn't have a lot of money. So we launched them with some very tactical posters that linked them to some stories that were already in the news. Like when Pauline Hanson was first running for office on an Australia is for Australians platform. So we decided to put a poster up across the road from her electoral office in Queensland, quite a long way from the nearest Nando's restaurant in Bondi. <laughs> it had a picture of a black chicken, a brown chicken and a white chicken and the headline, we're all the same on the inside, Pauline. <laughs> it cost $5,000, but this poster made news all around Australia. Nando's, of course, were thrilled. They said, wow, if you can do that with $5,000, do you reckon we can make some TV commercials with $10,000? <laughs> Time to make a leap, because there wasn't any precedent for making television commercials that cheaply. So we had to create ads that were specifically designed to look cheap and appropriate to the only media time slot we could afford. And this is one of the ads we made. Why not spoil yourself tonight? We're very eager to please. Prefer something a little exotic? Insatiable. Have, Have both, both of, of us for the hottest chickens. Call Nando's. <laughs> okay, so a little bit of background on this ad. When we went to shoot this commercial, we needed to find some chicken-sized lingerie. <laughs> no easy task. So my creative partner, Kieran, and I went into one of Australia's most famous sex shops, the Tool Shed, to see what we could find. Now, just to set the scene, at the time, Kieran was a cute, bubbly, blonde 22-year-old, and she has a voice that's a mixture of innocence and enthusiasm. So Kieran bounds up to the counter of the tool shed and says, we'd like to buy a leather harness, please. The guy behind the counter looks at me as if to say, well done, you mate. <laughs> then Kieran adds, but it got to, it's got to be small enough to fit on a chicken. <laughs> at this point, every pervert in the tool shed stops what they're doing and looks at Kieran and I like we've taken things to a level they never imagined possible. <laughs> Kieran, of course, realised what she said and said, no, 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 it's not a live chicken, it's a dead one. 
<laughs> which is clearly much better. In any case, these very inexpensive ads help make Nando's a household name around the nation, all because of the complementary skill sets of the creative team involved. But creativity and ideas only half solve the problem. The real challenge is to give solutions gravity. Now gravity creates attraction which pulls people to our cause. It creates engagement which pulls us all together and it creates alignment which makes sure we're all pulling in the same direction. And it doesn't matter whether you're motivating a team of 20, leading an organisation of 2,000, selling into a marketplace of 2 million or trying to move a nation of 20 million, you need gravity. And the lack of gravity is why so many new ideas and products don't take off. It's also why imitation so often beats innovation. Oded Schenker at The Ohio State University found that 97.8% of the value of an innovation goes to the imitators. 97.8%. And he's right. Almost none of us have heard of White Castle, but we all know the imitator, McDonald's. Diners Club is virtually worthless. MasterCard, priceless. I doubt any of you have even seen an MP man, but as we've all heard, we've all got iPods. Now, Oded Schenker took this research and left to completely the wrong conclusion. His takeout was, well, why bother innovating? Why, just not, why not just steal other people's ideas? And I'm sure some of you might be sitting in this room thinking exactly the same thing. I notice Matt Church has been taking some very thorough notes. <laughs> so how do we create gravity? Well, a physicist will tell you that gravity is a function of mass and proximity, how big you are and how close you get. So you can either increase gravity by increasing the mass of your idea through boldness and vision and amassing experience and knowledge and supporters, or you can reduce the distance it has to travel through, through connection and emotion and stories. In the mid-1980s, Nike stopped selling shoes and started creating gravity around a vision. They stopped talking about what went into a pair of trainers and started talking about what went into, a, into a, being a champion with a message that said, too often we are scared, scared of what we might not be able to do, scared of what people might think if we tried. We let our fears stand in the way of our hopes. We say no when we want to say yes. We sit quietly when we want to scream and we shout with the others when we should keep our mouth shut. Why? After all, we do only go around once. There's really no time to be afraid. So, so stop. Try something you've never tried. Risk it. Enter a marathon. Write a letter to the editor. Demand a race. Call the winners on the toughest court. Throw away your television. Bicycle across the United States. Try bobsledding. Try anything. Speak out against a designated hitter. Travel to a country where you don't speak the language. Patent something. Call her. You have nothing to lose and everything, everything, everything to gain. Just do it. Nike's CEO, Phil Knight, created gravity around a vision that was bigger than just flogging a few shoes. And he reduced the distance the idea had to travel through by making it part of an internal identity, by making it a way we see ourselves. And in doing so, he transformed a small shoe company from Portland, Oregon, into a global enterprise. So I guess what I want to share with you in these four keynotes is that it takes impossible thinking to imagine a solution that no one's ever seen before. We can only make those solutions successful and relevant if we truly understand the shifts taking place in our culture and our values. And we can only make those, those um, solutions possible if we embrace both sides of our creativity. But at the end of the day, with enough gravity, we can move the world. So I want to leave you with a challenge. I want, of each, I want each of you today to leave here holding an impossible thought, something that matters, something that if we could crack it would change the world. Because I believe if you can hold an impossible thought for long enough, possibilities begin to emerge. I believe the impossible is actually possible, like four keynotes in 20 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>